Excellent. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, so I'd like to present this case because it's um, one, um, not very common and challenging to me and two, probably adult endocrinologists um, has got more experience dealing with such cases, perhaps. Um, it's about a tall boy. Next slide, please. So he is um, an eight years, eight month old boy and complaint is accelerating growth for about two years. And he had adult smell and he had axillary hair when he was six and he was in Dubai and he was diagnosed with uh, premature adrenarche, which uh, as you all know, uh, not uncommon uh, presentation in boys and girls. Uh, but he's now taller than his 10 years old brother and he's tallest in classroom and started to get bullied. Um, the history, um, past medical history, has normal birth weight and normal uh, neonatal screening. And just to remind you about neonatal screening uh, is look for lots of things, including congenital hypothyroidism and uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, so this was normal. Uh, there is no consanguinity at all. Uh, Parents actually are of totally different ethnicity. Mother is Middle Eastern and father is European. Um, to give you a background about uh, family, uh, mother is a doctor. Father is uh, uh, like um, um, work in the health industry as well. And he was, uh, the boy was diagnosed with post viral fatigue and uh, he had ozone therapy. And he was on a supplement of T3 because he has altered reverse T3, uh, which is not a very common practice, but uh, this gives you an idea about family's attitude toward uh, some, uh, alternative medicine. He's not on current medication and they denied any herbal um, supplement. Um, he's having severe needle phobia. Next, please. <clears throat> So when I examined him, he was tall. Uh, he was on above 99th percentile and his, his father is very tall anyway, but still mid parental height is on the 75th percentile. Uh, he was obese, was BMI on the 98th percentile. He had no acanthosis and he had acne, a few spots on the face, uh, axillary hair, but no pubic hair. And the axillary hair is said to be there for about two to three years when he was diagnosed with premature adrenarche. And his testicular size was prepubertal, but his phallus was disproportionately enlarged. Um, I mean, this is a subjective thing, but it, 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 for me, it was uh, disproportionately enlarged. And that is his height, as you can see, he is um, tall for his age, um, above, no, above the uh, mid-parental height. Next, please. Can I just check, you mean this, these two points here, yeah, they're very close together? Yeah, I'll, because that's two, uh, two, two, uh, two visits, actually. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So he was, he had initial investigations before I see him and uh, he doesn't look like a uh, precocious puberty uh, to account for his accelerating growth. And um, his uh, IGF-1 was not raised and his 17 hydroxyprogesterone was raised um, at four nanogram per ml on UK money is 12. And um, normal range should be below for nanomole, below 2.5 or something like that. And uh, DHGS was slightly elevated. He had normal uh, thyroid function tests. Uh, he's not on uh, supplement now, the T3 supplement. And his prolactin was uh, normal. Um, so it looks like he had something wrong with his androgens because of the raised 17 hydroxyprogesterone. Next slide. Well, he's not got a high testosterone, so it's not going fully down that pathway. Interesting. Uh, yeah, it is interesting. Um, 
and his bone age was significantly uh, advanced, um, probably four, four and a half years uh, advanced. Uh, and that gives him um, predicted adult height with loss of about 10 centimeter if he's not um, treated. So it is, um, I started to get worried, of course. I'm, I'm, um, I, I don't think it is premature adrenarche and this advanced bone age has to be investigated further. So um, next step, of course, um, as you uh, would imagine, I've done the uh, short synectin test. And this was his cortisol, which is adequate response. 17 hydroxyprogesterone was very high. And the bottom values, this is my attempt to simplify it, actually the uh, interpretation for Zedina hydroxyprogesterone, but no mean it is very uh, accurate because um, uh, I'm sure you're aware there are some overlap, but um, his level is very consistent with um, um, non-classic uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Um, I hope you all agree with that. So very clear. Very clear. Which is, is yeah. Very curious. Yeah, and uh, interestingly, actually, even in CH, we don't see raised testosterone a lot for some reason. Uh, I can't explain it, but um, um, normally we see raised androstene down, uh, but th this is not the case in in his case. Uh, his renin was slightly elevated, but I wasn't sure if this is genuine or not, um, because it's unusual and non-classic. And also, uh, I think it might be related to the stress. He's, remember, he's very, very needle phobic. Uh, aldosterone was normal, and DHES was normal. Yes, so, so it might be that aldosterone is normal, being driven by a very high renin if there's uh, something blocking the pathway down towards aldosterone as well. Blocking aldosterone as well, well I mean... Uh, your 21 hydroxylates. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just in the same way that you've got a high precursor. I, I can't fully explain it, but that might be, might be a possible thought. Mm, 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 mm. Um, so, yeah. Um, so he was, uh, I put the diagnosis as a non-classic CAH, and obviously, uh, next slide please, yeah. Uh, I started him on a steroid because of his advanced uh, bone age, and um, after discussion with uh, parents, uh, it was very difficult discussion, and um, but when I started him on the, normally we start the dose between 10 to 15 milligram per meter square per day on, and on, on three divided doses. And he had, after that, parents know voracious appetite and significantly uh, gaining weight. And they were very nervous about it. Um, I reduced the dose to eight and then to six milligram. And um, I did scrot ultrasound just to look for TART, uh, which there was none. And it confirmed prepubertal testes because um, I was thinking about delaying his puberty if he was in precocious puberty. And uh, the diagnosis was confirmed on uh, genetic testing. So, so uh, can I ask about the dose of hydrocortisone? Uh, practically, I know it's when you say 10 per meter squared, so, so what does that mean practically? Do you, how do you break it up? Because what is the smallest strength of hydrocortisone tablets that you have? Uh, we give, uh, yeah, it's 10. We give up to a quarter of a tablet. I see, I see. So, um, and we, we, I know it is difficult to uh, break it as well, but we tell them as long as you use the uh, three quarters of the same tablets, that should be fine. It's not necessarily has to be very equal. I see. So, so, so he basically had a quarter three times a day. So two point. So seven. Actual dose was seven point five milligrams. I think in his yes, his um. I can't. Um, I think from the memory, I put him on five two point five two point five right. because he's he was like one meter square. I see. Uh, surface area. 
Yeah, 2.55, uh, sorry, 5, 2.5, 2.5. Okay, okay. Um, so genetic was confirmed and it was homozygous. Uh, interestingly, uh, uh, and as I mentioned, uh, parents are from totally different ethnicity, uh, but still they got the uh, same um, mutation, their carrier of, uh, of the same gene. Um, and interestingly also, I'm not sure if the next slide will say that, uh, yeah, uh, of course we screened all family and uh, I opened the can of worm. So his mother is a carrier, of course, and uh, in retrospect, she thinks she was, she was diagnosed with uh, post uh, uh, viral fatigue. And she think now it is cortisol deficiency. She got lots of connections with uh, many, many doctors and somebody uh, uh, advised her to start on hydrocortisol, um, five milligrams small dose daily. And she think now she's a totally different person. She's been reborn. Uh, his maternal auntie uh, as well diagnosed and his younger sister and two cousins um, all have been diagnosed now. Uh, the cousins and sister are affected. Uh, parents are carrier. Yes. They are on a different ages and each have their own problem. For example, one of the cousins, she's uh, 13, but her born age is 15. And so she's near to her final adult height and we have to do something and uh, but that's a different story. Let's focus on this one. But it, anyway, it was um, uh, it was a shock to the family. Uh, okay. I have to um, say, someone's got their hand up. Called the user. Is that there for? I don't. Someone. Yes. Uh, hi. Yes, it's Sarah. Thank you for a lovely case. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Where did you get the genetic testing done? Oh, they did it privately. Um, they did it privately. Uh, the, the family are VVVVIP, and they don't they don't wait for our. Uh, they did it. Well done. They did it in the UAE. No, 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 in Germany. They send it to Germany. Okay. okay. Well, at least you must have told them what gene to look for. Uh, sorry, say it again, Pa. Did you? Uh, you must have told them what gene to look for. And oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. we were looking at uh, CYP21. Yeah, and then, yeah. Uh, um, Al Mokhtar, you want to you put your hand up as well? I just I want to make sure, I mean, definitely had a new, new uh, neonatal screening for uh, CAH. Mm. Yeah. It's almost higher. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, point. In fact, the non-classic, about 80% of them, uh, actually will not be detected on, uh, on the neonatal screening because the cutoff point they take is much higher uh, than the case of non-classic CH. So it's targeted, the, the, the level, the cutoff level is targeted the classic CH. Yes, exactly. Uh, mm. Because this is not life-threatening. So we're looking only mm. really for the classics. And um, yeah. this, uh, this is a very good story. And... Um, in the females, we miss, they, they present very subtly sometimes with a bit of facial hair. People label them as PCO sometimes. It's, very, it's quite a difficult, yeah. it's a very difficult diagnosis. Um, I'm very interested, as you know, in uh, steroid replacement options. And um, let, me, let me finish your slides and then I'll show you some other interesting uh um it is the next slide was a discussion i think i can't remember uh yeah that's the weight gain can you can see after starting steroid how bad it is yeah uh, which is 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 difficult it's really difficult situation because we have to treat this child this child have will have compromised final adult height if he is left untreated so we have to treat him. At the same time, would we accept this? Of course, parents are very, very worried. They are very healthy uh, family. Uh, they are 
much into alternative medicine and uh, fungal screen of urine every six months and this sort of thing. So weight gain for them is really huge thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, and there's still, I mean, it's early on now, three months, um, but um, we ha I have to treat him. And the, my difficulties or my discussion point, if I may, on the next slide, uh, this. Um, interested to know people's uh, colleagues view about steroid and obesity and would low dose steroid like this can lead to obesity um, in your experience I mean um, yeah I, I've got a, I'm going to just go to a, a site that I've put up with some quite interesting um facts so, so this is a slightly different topic but it's now moving into the CAH uh, area and um, one of the bits of evidence when you know I've been very interested in moving patients from hydrocortisone to prednisolone once daily I don't know if you're aware of that this is something that I've been doing for the last about five years and we've now started leaking into congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So I found this paper, okay? And it's a very good paper, 2004. Um, and this is, I found this paper about, I don't know, 10 years ago when I was looking for a dose equivalence. And I was really thinking of what we see, which is Addison's disease, but the paper was about CH, and I've used this as a focus of starting a huge project, and it's been very successful. And I'll just show you this, right? This is one of the very few randomized studies in the world for children with CH. And it's been ignored because it's in Spanish, and it comes from Brazil, or Portuguese, and it comes from Brazil. Uh, but I've copied them, and they're right. Okay, and, and uh, it's just that it's in a very obscure journal, but it's very interesting. And they start, can we just go through this, right? I'll just explain. So they mentioned that hydrocortisone given for CH are unsatisfactory and partially successful in regarding growth. Non-compliance is common, short half-life needs three times daily administration, which is what you're doing. Okay, so this is the, this is the normal standard international treatment as you are following. And then they say multiple daily hydrocortisone doses do not reproduce cortisol chronobiology. And this was a line that really struck with me. And I was trying to look at ways that we treat uh, adrenal insufficiency. And when we give three doses of hydrocortisone, the third dose is not normal. It's, it's, and patients, I've got many other slides on this, but patients are very cortisol sensitive to the third dose and disturbs this hypothalamic rhythm. Okay. And then they say, They've got no other choice, of course, but because synthetic glucoids could improve clinical contact, we evaluated the possible use of a one-year treatment period with a single morning oral dose of prednisolone. Okay, this is what I've copied. And they took 44 patients with patients just like yours, randomized to sex and age match groups. So 23 groups got prednisolone, okay, 2.4 to 3.5 milligrams per uh, square meter, and the other got your normal dose, 10 milligrams of hydrocortisone. And after one year, bone maturation was stable in the PRED group, whereas a slight increase was seen in the hydrocortisone group. So the prednisolone group achieved better control. A slight increase occurred. So they say, uh, and height and weight. So their summary is patients with 21 deficiency treated for one year with a single moiety of prednisolone appear to achieve better clinical and hormone control than 300 hydrocortisone. So this is a practical solution because it's a drug that's available all over the world. It's not like I'm asking for some new expensive drug. And then they said the dose of prednisolone that they used was found to be incorrect and they dropped it, okay? They dropped the dose. And so I've done the same. So I'll summarize it by saying that we now have about 100 patients with Addison's disease who are taking prednisolone three milligrams and fludro 100. And 
I've got a lot of data on that. And we're now starting to look at CAH in, in younger people. This is not taken off yet. But if we do, your patient would get one or two milligrams once in the morning. Yeah. I think we always, in pediatrics, we always worry about uh, prednisolone and uh, dexamethasone uh, on the, uh, its effect on bone age and accelerating bone age and premature epiphyseal um, fusion. I think the problem is that we have in the past used too much prednisolone. So there's mm -hmm. lots, and lots of publications that say prednisolone is terrible, but all of them used five milligrams or more because that was a single yeah. tablet. Single tablet is five milligrams. So you see, we have one milligram tablets and that is, that is a key. So we can give one milligram or one and break it in half and give one and a half milligrams. But you give, need to give really, really low doses. Um, and I think it's worth, if you've got a family, mm. so you, you could even do a study. You could randomize half of them. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, but, not, the, not this family, I doubt. <laughs> but but I, think, I, think, I think you might find that prednisolone is a better option because, mm. because mm. one of the things that we have found is the third dose, the third dose of, um, of prednisolone is very harmful. So um, I've put a number of lists of publications that explain it. And, and I'll be honest with you, I started this research purely because of the cost of hydrocortisone, right? Hydrocortisone was very expensive in this country. It turns out because of a, a uh, patent thing, okay? And I've been approaching the NHS and government signed a petition. Um, and we basically discovered that one company were doing something illegal and we've got them uh, well, there's a court case against them now, but we basically made our own hydrocortisone and prednisolone for our study. So we made blind hydrocortisone. So we're in the middle of a study randomizing patients to hydrocortisone adults. This is 1055 or prednisolone 3 placebo placebo. So, of course, we had to make our own tablets for that study. And then we sold hydrocortisone on the open market. And the first thing that happened is I got a phone call from the director of the other manufacturers, first of all, threatening me with legal action, and secondly, offering me a bribe to not do it. It's terrible, really. Uh, but we did, and the price, their prices also had to come down because there's no competition. And then the competition market authority are now taking them to court for their illegal actions. But in the meantime, in the meantime, the hydrocortisone and prelitin study is ongoing. And although there's no longer a price issue, we're now finding that we were lucky and it's better. It's better than uh, hydrocortisone for Addison's disease because the patients like it, it's once daily, but the profile of uh, steroid you get is more <laughs> in with, with normal physiology. Now, of course, it's difficult to see it because sometimes you need to give reverse circadian and that is a problem. And I, I, think, it's, I think it's not an easy thing to do. But um, we're just going to start off with 18-year-olds and then, and then move down. But, I, mm. but I'm just suggesting that if you find that the weight gain is a huge problem, if you can get mm. one milligram tablets, and I'm sure if they're rich, they can import them from the UK. It's very, very cheap. It's not a cost issue. It's in a bit. Mm. Um, it might yeah. Be yeah, interesting, interesting. Uh, this would bring me to, to the other just, and also, I think in the past, patients are over braces because they're trying to normalize the 17 hydroxy progesterone. And this is True. one of the issues, I think. Uh, that's why they are on, on, on too much steroids. Yeah. Yeah. And this will bring me to the, the next point as well is, uh, as I said, mother has lots of connection with the medical field. And one of the adult endocrinologists advised her to give a higher dose of hydrocortisone in the evening rather than in the morning, claiming that uh, this is better way of suppressing androgen uh, production. Mm. I'm not sure about this. Well, that is that is for that has been published in the past. That's history. That's, oh, that's wrong. But it has been used for many years. Certainly, when I was in training, I was taught to use. Do you know what I was taught? I was taught to give reverse circadian prednisolone of five milligrams at night and 2.5 in the morning. Now, this was about 30 years ago when I was a trainee. 
And I'm absolutely certain now that this is wrong, but I'm seeing older patients who have been treated in the past and they're still on the reverse. I'm slowly weaning them down. I'm switching them to circadian and then reducing the dose. And my final aim, and I've got a few adults with CAH, they're now down to either four or three milligrams in the morning. So the reverse circadian is very uh, clever on the biochemistry. It does suppress the rise in ACTH early morning, but it definitely causes all the problems of Cushing. Mm. Weight, especially mm. weight gain. So, so um, it's going to be very difficult, you know, because if they've got a doctor they trust who says that with confidence, and it is in the old textbooks, it does say use reverse Akkadian treatment to suppress the antigen as your main issue. This is for girls, really, not for boys, for girls. You know, they, they, because mm. when they, they have a bit of facial hair, which really distresses them. So I think, I mean, do you use, in the past, the pediatricians at uh, Great Ormond Street used to use um, dexamethasone. And when I discussed it with them, they, they explained to me that because children are less compliant, if you give dexamethasone and they miss it occasionally, it, it's better for the facial hair. They all agreed that they were Cushing's, but the, they were saying to me, look, your options are either hirsutism or obesity. If you give more steroid, <laughs> you obese. Mm. If you give less steroid, you become uh, hirsute. Mm. 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 So uh, can I tell you, I'll tell you one other story, right? In, um, I have a patient who must be now 40 years old. She had classical CH. Um, her, she had a salt losing crisis shortly after birth. And um, she was put on various steroids in her childhood. And she told me she knew all about them. She'd been on hydrocortisone, prednisolone, dexamethasone, tried all of them. And she came to the adult clinic 20 years ago. And she said to me, do you know the problem? And she was, she probably had a bit of PCO as well. So she was very hirsute when she cut the dose of dexamethasone. And when she put it up, she was quite cushingoid and obese. And she was doing it herself, but I was talking to her. And then one day she came to the clinic and she said, do you know, I really hate my adrenal glands. I want them removed. So I spoke to our adrenal surgeon and he did a bilateral adrenalectomy in 2007. And she has since then been on prednisolone three milligrams once a day. And she is so happy because she's not her suit, she has no testosterone androgens from her adrenal glands, and she's just on a replacement. And she's not obese because she does not need a high dose to suppress the androgens. So that's, I would never do that for someone who's got uh, partial because of course you put them at risk of Addisonian crises. But my patient already had that risk. She had several crises before then because her adrenals were useless. She said, my adrenals are useless. They only make trouble. They don't make any good hormones. <laughs> so that's an interesting story just to mention. Are there any other? I think um, uh, just one more point. I think on the reverse circadian uh, treatment, I think there was a paper in 2021 where they looked back and about, uh, um, I think, uh, 23 patients or something like that, where they found no benefit of the RCT. There was absolutely no benefit of, at all. So I think they, have, they used that old uh, studies where it was being used and then tried to see if there was any benefit. They didn't find any. Yeah. So I don't think that works. You know, I haven't seen that paper and that would be really useful because- um, It's a 2021. Um, let me just see if I can quickly- That would be really-, really Because, because um, it's going to be a hard struggle really. Yeah. To, uh, it was in uh, endocrinol met, uh, metabolism 2021. Is that JCNM? No, it's uh, endocrinology and metabolism. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So they used it in uh, patients with congenital adrenal hyperplasia, boys and girls. You have uh, got the... Do you want to share your screen? Have you got the reference with you? Uh, uh, let me see. It's by Ilja Dubinsky. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I think it's the General of Pediatric Endocrinology and Metabolism. So okay. Sharif might have seen it. Okay. D-I-N-S-K-E-Y. Is that right? D-U-B-I-N-S-K-I. D-U-B-I-N-S-K-I. Yeah. Um, that, 
that will be that kind of evidence is really useful. And and you know, there's so much in the literature these days to try yeah. to try and cover everything is uh, is very tricky. But that kind of yeah. paper um, would be would be extremely useful. My other thought uh, was about fludrocortisone um, uh, with its, uh, if you like, cortisone sparing effect. So this is one uh, I, I might consider um, if I have to. Um, not sure there is good evidence for this, but uh, we sometimes do if we have to uh, use very high dose hydrocortisone. Um, my other point is, as you're aware, we, we, for monitoring uh, response, we used to use nowadays uh, the androstine dione rather than 17 hydroxyprogesterone, as Dr. Mokhtar was uh, saying. But now, giving androstine dione is normal, and uh, then uh, I think I have no other uh, reliable way of uh, monitoring response apart from the 17 hydroxyprogesterone and perhaps bone age every year or so. Uh, but my question is, um, does needle phobia and the stress during taking sample, th could this affect the level of 17-hydroxyprogesterone? It's a good question. Um, I suppose it comes in through ACTH, doesn't it? And because certainly if it's really, really, and I, the problem with defining stress, are if the ACTH goes up, and they've got a block in the pathway, then that might explain. Yeah. But um, it's more, but I mean, the synapsin test is quite clear, though, isn't it? Oh, it's for the reliable it it. response, I see. Yeah, for the response, yeah. Hmm. If you yeah. want to use 17 of gestrone, just try to make it twice normal, three times normal, not to normalize it. I mean, that's what yeah. yeah, yeah. I've just seen, um, someone sent me that link, and I've just found this. This is the paper that uh, Professor Aftab was talking about. Yeah, Karim, I've just pasted it in the chat. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read this. Our data do not support reverse circadian. Mm. Uh, the other thing I noticed, and this might help you, uh, Dr. Sharif, there's another study when I was doing the search for Dubinsky, talking about salivary 17 OHP levels in children. Uh, and that might be easier if you've got a needle phobic um, Mm, 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 mm. I was thinking of doing a, a dry uh, uh, paper um, blood spot test on him rather than a venous blood. Yes. The same like they do with the screen. I suppose so, yes. It, it's yeah. yeah, yeah. And also, one of the adult endocrinologists suggested to them that the best time to do uh, 17 hydroxyprogesterone is two hours after giving morning hydrocortisone. Uh, something I'm not aware of. We uh, I used to just check 17 hydroxyprogesterone fasting in the morning. Yes. Uh, uh, without tablet. Yeah. So so um, either works, and you, what you need to be is consistent. So um, so if you the problem is if you do one in the fasting and then the next one after hydrocortisone then of course the second one will be much lower than the first, not because mm -hmm. you've improved control. So um, in patients who come late, we try and do it the same number of hours. We do the same when we're trying to look at Cushing's patients on uh, metyropone, for example. Uh, we, we try and do it the same number of hours after the dose, otherwise you get big variances that mislead you. Um, if you always do it fasting, then your reference range will be a bit different, but... Um, you can see a change. Mm, mm, mm. The, the wrong thing to do is to switch. So, because, <laughs> oh, I mean, it'll be lower. And then it'll, because it's very quick, the falling ACTH happens within, I think, 90 minutes of the dose of hydrocortisone. And the cortisol falls quickly after that, too. So, um, it's just, just mm, it, mm. It, you're having a difficult time. I think if you, yeah, it's convincing them to use a, a lower dose steroid. And if you can give a once daily in the morning, as you've heard, I'm very keen on prednisolone now. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are a couple of other things that are being trialed. There is a new drug 
um, called Chronicourt, and it's been launched in the UK uh, by the name F Modi. It's brand new, very expensive, and it's simply slow release hydrocortisone. And um, it's licensed now uh, for it's twice a day, and it's licensed for a complete CAH. And um, this might be something to think about if they want to mm. expensive drugs. But I am, so they've called this twice daily toothbrush regimen. In other words, have it in the morning and the evening. But this has just been approved. And um, I don't believe that it's better than prednisolone once daily. Um, but this is going through big trials. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, is there any experience with anti-androgens and um... Uh, aromatase uh, inhibitors in no. CH. Uh, so th so th this is just coming out. There's two, two drugs. Uh, one of them, it's not yet licensed, it's going undergoing trials, is a uh, antibody against ACTH. It's a MAB. I don't know if it'll catch on. Uh, and the other is um, a drug that will suppress ACTH production that's not a steroid. Hmm. So they're attacking the, uh, the the source of ACTH rather than anything else. Yeah. That's, that's what... uh, interestingly, I forgot to mention this. Uh, this child ACTH was not raised. Say that again. Uh, his ACTH wa was not raised. How odd. That is very unusual. Uh, yeah, uh, but still happens. Uh, in non-classic. Yes. Okay. That makes yeah. it, that makes it definitely more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Because always I thought I mean I I thought is our aim is to uh, suppress ACTH and therefore suppress androgen production. Indeed. Uh, yeah, but actually, uh, when you read more about it, there are many. Uh, they say the dynamic of the blockage itself causes excess androgen production and still responded to hydrocortisone, is, which is interesting. Um, yes. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, is, um, it, is, it, is it usual for the non-classic in males to present in this early uh, age and with this uh, profound symptoms? Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure we missed lots. I'm sure we missed lots of them. Um, I think this, uh, because of the family um, background, uh, they, they took it further and they did not stop at uh, um, premature adrenarche, like they have been told. And we know in, in premature adrenarche you can get advanced bone age, but maximum you can get is about twenty percent of the chronological age. So. I would say, think about something like two years or so, but you know, advancement, but in this case, four years. So, um, yeah, I think we miss uh, patients. It seems like this uh, uh, deletion uh, or genetic defect is very common. Uh, and this is a prime example uh, of two ethnicity have the same gene. And more interestingly, this mother's sister is married to somebody from... America, and also they got the same gene. That is so it, is, it, it, it seems it is very, very uh, more yeah. common than we think. Well, well, that would suggest that being a heterozygote has some survival advantage that we're unaware of. If it's mm. very prevalent in the world. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. So here is something that we've been looking at uh, new treatments for CAH. And green is what is currently just about to be licensed. And purple is not yet available for humans. And so there are CRF1 receptors. There's a new drug um, that is looking to block CRH and therefore block ACTH. That's being trialed in phase two, very early on. Um, so that might, that might be an answer because it, the androgens that's compl that they're complaining of and then we've already got the ones you talked about, like hydrocortisone, modified with hydrocortisone, delayed with hydrocortisone, and my favorite, low dose prednisolone, which is, um, I think, going to give you enough replacement and enough 
suppression of negative feedback, but not make them as cushing oil as the others. Now, of course, your patient actually probably has also got, like many patients have, simple obesity on top of his CAH. And uh, you could manage that, of course, medically nowadays with things like semaglutide. Is he too young for that? He's very young. I think he's the nearest is liraglutide. Um, but uh, another thing I thought about uh, is metformin, uh, yeah. because because you know there there is some element of insulin resistance in non classic CH. So I thought might be might be yeah to start with. <clears throat> yes. Um, now Sarah has said that you do have one of them tablets. So um, if you have got one of them tablets at ICLDC that Sarah put in the chat. I think it would be really wise to give it a try. I don't know if one of them will be enough. I would go with one. Um, we're currently looking on some sort of analog basis that 20 is similar to between two and three. And you want to give a little bit to try and suppress growth. Um, that might be worth trying a, a single, yeah. milligram, maybe one and a half milligrams. But I agree, mm. titrating the dose without blood tests will be hard. I just reread that salary cortical paper. It said it's not very good, it's with a summary. It didn't say this is the full way forward, the salivary 170 OHP. Yeah. Um, well, look, thank you for sharing this very, very difficult case. Sharif? Yes. Yeah. You, you were talking about uh, GLP 1. Um, yes. You know that semaglutide has been used in uh, adolescence successfully. Off yeah, off license. Off yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, I'm sure that can be discussed because clinically it's safe. There is no reason clinically, you know, we, we were always used uh, uh, clinical uh, medication off license for years, you know, uh, because that's safe just because there's no license as long as they consent and you show them the evidence. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So papers have been, uh, you know, th there are studies there. Uh, they might be observational, but they, they have done it. So have a look at that, and then you can discuss with them. And semaglutide can be quite useful. It's not approved, yeah. but off license, it might be useful if obesity is a big problem for them. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree. I agree. That's a really good thought. I have an adult who has really difficult Cushing's, and we finally operated and cured her, and she was 106 kilos. And she dropped about 150, but then didn't lose any more. And now she's on semaglutide and she's losing weight because she also has, she definitely had Cushing's, but she also had simple obesity. And she's doing very well with the semaglutide. So, it, it, and that weight is zooming up scare, in a scary way I saw on that, on that graph you showed us. So, so I think uh, Dr. Aptab's idea is a really good one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll discuss with the family. Yeah. That's, that's very useful, yeah, thank you. Not sure if there is any other point I put under discussion, I can't remember. Uh, uh, no, I think, I think that was the last. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh boy. It is uh, interesting now, I'm treating uh, the whole family with different uh, presentation, different uh, thing. One of them, actually, I started uh, uh, GNRH and the growth hormone, uh, the one nearly closing her epiphyses. Um, so well, is that she's short, so she's tall, but short for her final height. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's what happens. They grow very quickly compared to all their friends. They're very tall. Then they fuse. Then their friends keep on growing. Yeah. 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 And. Um, is interesting as well, uh, just, just, just um, I remember this, because I've seen recently with Accutane, uh, you know, this anti-acne medication, um, it, one of its uh, really not very common side effect, but actually I think is more common is accelerating bone age. Um, and uh, that's something for colleague to be aware of, uh, because now I started to mention to any child on growth hormone not to take uh, Recutain. Okay, Sarah's got a hand up. Just to make a minor comment about CAH. So um, about 
almost 50% of Emiratis who have non-classical CAH do not have a mutation, but have a copy number variation. So if you're gonna send them to a lab abroad, please make sure that they do both copy number variation as well as just genetic sequencing. So MLPA and genetic sequencing. Now that's mm, another piece of a very clever small print there. Mm. Was unaware mm. of. Yeah, mm, thank you. It's for not that. the case in the UK at all. So in the UK, it's probably about ten percent. Uh, sorry, is that, is that something that you've published? Because it need, that needs to be known for the UA pop. I mean, you know it. It would be good to uh, audit a few and just say it's, this gene is is a, unique to the UAE or wherever you find it. Yeah. No, we've not published it with 30 plus patients a day. I don't think I'm going to publish it in the near future either, but it's, yeah. yeah, hopefully at some point. You know, the th 30 is a lot. Agreed. Oh, okay. Dr. Asala, don't go there. <laughs> Thank you. Prof, how are you? Hi. It's Farhana here. Oh, hello. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about, um, I know you talked about circadian rhythm, but I, if you remember my patient, the only patient that I have with Addison's, um, uh, he ha finds it very difficult when we have longer, you know, um, summer days. And as you said, that the last dose is not really that uh, important, but he gets fatigued by like 11 a.m. And because the mornings are really early. So have is there any... Um, I'm trying to think, is, is there any like studies or anything you've seen anecdotally with like, you know, long summers or, you know, um, so, uh, uh, short uh, nights and so on? Yeah. Uh, uh, what's very interesting is, is we're doing a lot of quality of life data as we're going with this study. So we're in the middle of a randomized controlled trial. And as I mentioned, we're giving patients prednisolone three milligrams in the morning and then two placebo tablets okay and it's really interesting because you know people say oh, i feel tired and i feel feel a bit of a boost by my hydrocortisone the placebo gives them the same boost so that is quite interesting, interesting. because because um normal you know we, we don't really and i tell you it's very interesting if you look at the pulsatility of steroid of hydrocortisone of cortisol in normal people Although we say it's caused by stress and there are pulses when you're stressed, we don't understand the word stress. And it's very interesting because the timing of it doesn't fit. I've looked at so many curves now in individual, it's pulsatile, there's, a, there's an ultradian rhythm underneath the circadian rhythm. And we did a whole review of a lot of data and it's very clear that nobody knows what drives the pulses. Sometimes there's a whole lot of them at five o'clock in the morning, um, someone's been doing this thing called deconvoluting of the data. In other words, they use mathematical modeling to work out when the pulses are. And it's very clear that we don't understand what starts them off. Sometimes it starts at 5 a.m. Often it starts at 5 a.m., but not always. Before, before they wake up, I'm talking about in the UK where, where the sun rises a bit later and um, it's dark. So the pulses start even in the dark about an hour and a half before uh, dawn so so there's a lot of psychology about tiredness and a lot of us feel tired at 11 a.m but because because we're not on tablets we just say oh it's just normal i think that's what it is um when it's hot and you've got a long day in some countries in europe they have a thing called a siesta you know yeah. so i think that um your treatment is okay and um yeah, you know, the wrong thing to do is give them too much steroid because I, I have yes. patients, they self medicate. They say, oh, I'm having a bad day today. You know, my bank manager has told me off, oh, I better have some more hydrocortisone. It's, it's, it doesn't work like that at all, but people think that it does. So, oh, what I, about people who are in like Sweden? Have we done any studies on anybody who has Addison's over there? They have with over there. I don't know their data, but. A lot, most of their patients are on three times daily hydrocortisone. And they are the places that are starting to use these newer slow release hydrocortisone. There's a drug called Plenadrin that yeah. in some parts of the world. Uh, but it looks, the, the profile of Plenadrin is identical to uh, prednisolone. 
okay. so, uh, so that so the people who think planodinal work, if you can't get hold of it, we just use prednisolone. Okay. The, the key thing, though, is to use a much smaller dose than you expect. So five milligrams is definitely too much. If you give anybody five milligrams daily, like we do for lots of diseases, if you leave them on five milligrams maintenance, it's not maintenance, it's more than maintenance, and it will cause trouble. It will cause osteoporosis, it will increase the blood glucose a little bit. You know, it's not a huge problem, a little bit. So I'm on a huge push to... You use four milligrams, isn't that right? I'm, I'm on the way, so that's what I... When I started <laughs> milligrams, everyone said, what? You know, and now they're used to it. And now I'm saying, well, about half our patients are going on three. Oh. So we're between three and four. And in order to decide, define which is the right one, we have started, to be honest, doing uh, prednisolone levels. So this is an assay. We've set up an, an LCMS assay here uh, because I can't think of any other way to do it. And so we've been... I'll just show you on my screen here, prednisolone replacement. So, so we've now got an assay and we measure pred levels and we adjust the dose. So for example, this patient, correct dose, it says, he's on four milligrams at 7N because he's quite a fast metabolizer, the brown line, okay? The yellow guy, he's only on two milligrams and he's very well because his levels are, he's metabolizing more slowly. So my range is now two to four. And we always start with four, because I don't want to underrun at the start of my data, but it looks like, uh, yeah. I've, I've got one patient with Addison's disease who is now on one milligram of prednisolone and is a curve mm. of and he feels fine. Is it related to his weight? It might be. Should be. Well, I thought it would be. Yeah, there, it might be. It might be. The, the, so it, I'm saying might because there are some people who are very obese and still only need one milligram. So it's not always, mm. not always. There must be a variation on the yeah, receptors. Can, yeah. Well, you can see it. You can see, you see the red yeah. here, right? He is on four and he's a very, he starts off at the same, he takes his tablet early morning with the, these two guys, let's say they're in the same, they're not, okay? The brown curve is very, very common. So that's why most patients are on four milligrams. Okay. I don't know. But there's occasional people get four milligrams who have a high glucose. And so then, so we're now doing this. And if they're not metabolizing it quickly, then I'm dropping and dropping until they start lower and end like the yellow person, which is two. So uh, so we want it as the yellow. You do want it as the yellow, yes. Okay. Yellow. Uh, and, it, and of course you don't know, we have an assay, so this is not available in most parts of the world. Yeah. But uh, I'm saying to people, don't just give, this is now affecting our COPD patients. You know, anyone who gets prednisolone, they all get 40 milligrams, but some of them need less and some need more because there's a very big, not very big, there's a medium variance in metabolism of prednisolone. So we're finding all kinds of new things about an old drug. Yeah, that, that is, the, that is the, the truth of it. So a couple of years ago, we, we published a thing saying you might think about using prednisolone because of a very good risk profile. And um, we basically have got our mean dose of hydrocortisone now for 80 patients is 20 milligrams. And our mean dose at the time was 3.7. It's slowly coming down. This is between three and four. So this is what our, sorry, this is here, prednisolone. This is the, the variance. We've got some who seem to need, need or take more yeah, a small number, but this is the mean, three milligrams. The median, I should say. Anyway, this is an area of active research that is still ongoing. And uh, if you've got patients on hydrocortisone, and I think Sharif's patient is a really good one to try it out on, I think I think prednisone would be a better bet. Um, and you can monitor the androgens. I know you can't do blood tests because it's pain, it's difficult. Um, of course, you're going to monitor growth, so it might improve. Sorry, I got cut off. I just wanted to ask you, uh, sorry, um, I just wanted to ask because it was a good segue to when you talked about COPD. I have a few patients who are, who were, who are, and because they were given, you know, like they get, um, um, uh, a lot of steroid injections because of their, you know, hips or knees. So should we really reduce the prednisolone to even four or three? 
and, and see from there. Yeah. So these are people who have got COP. Hang on, they give, are they given like steroid injections like uh, Kenalog? Yes, this is the problem. So this lady was given like every six weeks or three months Kenalog injection. And how I discovered that she was started. Sorry? Or into a joint? Yeah. Okay. But every six weeks is is really a lot and what happened was she was uh, she went into uh, admitted in ajman for severe hypotension they thought she had an mi she didn't have an mi and she kept dropping her blood pressure so she was going into adrenal you know crisis and when they give her fluids she's better yeah. so i i actually did uh, um just checked her cortisol and acth and we did um um you know a curve and and we found out that she just had really low cortisol I uh, started on uh, uh, first was we started on prednisolone, and then and then we uh, switched her to hydrocortisone. See what is the the requirement that she needs, and she doesn't attend anymore. But during COVID, she didn't attend. So, but it's just the the issue is that she does you know when she goes into crisis, usually if she gets uh, it, it, before surgery, they don't give her you know steroids. But I was just thinking what would be her optimal dose? So how can we test what is her optimal dose? Yeah, very, very good. And unfortunately, unfortunately, she never returned. Her adrenals didn't, they're, they're just non-functioning right yeah. now. And if you keep giving Kenlog, they'll remain non-functioning because Kenlog is really, really, really potent. Um, and it lasts for a really long time. Uh, I've got exactly what one of these patients, a funny story, this and other stories from last week, a patient was sent by her GP because the GP looked at her and said, you look a bit Cushingoid uh, and did a cortisol and it was zero. Okay, patient's fine, right? So he sent this casualty saying the lab rang me, the cortisol was undetectable. So we saw the patient, did another blood test and indeed it was undetectable. So that's very strange. I said, do any creams, any tablets, any herbs, anything from anywhere? Completely denied it. Then I looked on the computer and I saw on the x-ray list of things she'd had was an injection of Kenalog six weeks before into her joint. I went back and said, did you have an injection of steroids? Said, oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you about that. Six weeks later, cortisol zero. Now, this patient is well, and she said to me, that's the one that was useless. I'm not going to have another one. So I said, okay, we'll just keep an eye on you. So we're doing repeats and accent tests. The first accent test was completely flat. The second one was a bit better. So I think as the Ken log wears off, she will recover. She doesn't need any steroid, but I'm watching her very carefully. But you discovered her like just recently. I'm just thinking of like someone who's had Ken log for years. So yeah. she, 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 I don't know the likelihood of her adrenals working anymore. I mean, how often should we even test? Well, well, you see, the thing is, if your patient is going to keep on having Kenalog, then they'll never work. My patient has said that Kenalog was rubbish, <laughs> and so I'm not having it again. So then I'm thinking, right, we'll let them wake up. And we're now, I'll tell you the dates. She had the Kenalog on May the 16th, and she had a synaptin test last week, and her baseline was 99, and her peak was 238. So that's better than zero, but she's not passed. But I've not given her any steroid because she's this Ken log still leaking out of her back. And she's not going to have any more. So I'm going to just keep into that. She's having another one on Monday. And then I'll, I'll know. Um, listen, thank you very much, everybody. That was a very interesting uh, meeting. And a really good case. Uh, Shuri, really good case. So thank you very thank you. much. Can, can you please, uh, Professor, sh share the prednisolone paper? I want to, to have a look at the uh, evidence about growth, please. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Mm. In fact, uh, it's, it's on the internet. I'll send, I'll send you the link. I'll send you the link now. Thanks a lot. And thanks, all colleagues, for uh, your contribution. It was very useful. Thank you all very much. Let me know if your patient agrees to take, but I'll send that paper, and I'll be fascinated to hear because... Yeah. And it's definitely worth publishing because we need to know what the best to CH is a completely unopened can of worms, can I say? And you're about to open a can of worms. Yeah, particularly in children. Yes, absolutely. And, absolutely. and as you as you mentioned, the hydrocortisone is not physiologic whatsoever. Yes, yes.